Okay, it looks like it's three o'clock, so I guess we can probably start. Uh, so today's uh, sutta is called the Bahitika Sutta, it's Majjhima Nikaya number 88. And has everybody got a copy of that sutta? Have you? Everybody? No? You don't want a copy? <laughs> Just listen, okay. Okay. Yeah, maybe that's, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So, um, okay, so it's the Bahitika Sutta. And uh, the way I chose this sutta is simply I had a look at the list of suttas that haven't been done before here. And this was one of those suttas. And it's also a very nice and simple sutta. And I, I kind of like the simple suttas. I don't know, there's something, I, I used to like the profound stuff, but these days I, I actually prefer the simple stuff because you, you actually have a fairly good idea of what it means, uh, which is quite nice. So, <laughs> so uh, this is a simple sutta, and it's often, they are also very practical for that reason here. Okay, so let us start. And um, so, Majjhima 88, Mahitika, the, the cloak. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Samati in Jeta's Grove, Anattapindika's park. Then, when it was morning, the Venerable Ananda, dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Savati for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Savati and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he went to the eastern park, to the palace of Megara's mother, for the days abiding here. So this, uh, he's living it in, in Savati, and this is the other famous monastery in Savati. There's two famous monasteries. Uh, one is the Jetavana, uh, and at the Pindikas Park, uh, which you see at the beginning. Uh, and the second one is the, which is here called the Palace of Megara's Mother. Megara's Mother is another name for Visaka, uh, Lady Visaka, uh, perhaps the Buddha's foremost female lay disciple. Uh, and that's, that was her donation to the Sangha, the palace of Megara. Palace is not really a good translation because it's a bit weird that the Sangha can, can accept palaces, right? Here's a palace for you, take, take this palace. Uh, and, but the word pasada in Pali means something like a house or perhaps you know, a, a kind of a maybe la- nice house or a nice building which is suitable for monastics. It doesn't actually really mean palace as far as I can see. Otherwise it uh, surely wouldn't be allowable for monastics to live there. And there are other reasons too for thinking it doesn't actually mean that. So he went there uh, for the, the days abiding. That's like just, you know, that you're hanging out for the day, med- meditating, you know, that, that's basically what it means. So. Now on that occasion, King Pasenadi of Kosala had mounted the elephant, Eka Pundarika, and was riding out from Savati at midday. He saw the Venerable Ananda coming in the distance and asked the minister, Siri, Siri Vadda, what that is the Venerable Ananda, is it not? Yes, sir, that is the Venerable Ananda. Then King Pasenadi of Kosala told a man, come good man, go to the Venerable Ananda and pay homage in my name with your head at his feet, saying, Venerable Sir, King Pasenadi of Kosala, pays homage with his head at the Venerable Ananda's feet. Then say this, Venerable Sir, if the Venerable Ananda has no urgent business, perhaps the Venerable Ananda would wait a moment out of compassion. So just briefly again, for those who are not aware of this, King Pasenadi, of course, is the king of the large Kosalan Empire, uh, the capital city of which is Savati. So this is why this is happening at, uh, happening at Savati. And he was a very devout Buddhist, King Pasein Ali. There's lots of suttas uh, scattered throughout the Nikayas about meetings between King Pasein Ali and the Buddha. And some of those suttas are actually very nice. There's a whole Sangyutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya called the uh, Kosala Sangyutta, which are all about the meetings between King Pasein Ali and the Buddha. And some very nice suttas in there, very beautiful similes and things uh, actually from in that collection, uh, and quite easy, uh, simple, basic suttas, but still very beautiful and profound in some ways. Uh. And he's riding on the elephant, Eka Pundarika, uh, which means like Eka is one Pundarika, as a type of lotus, the one lotus elephant, essentially what that means. Uh. 
So uh, then he sends this man and uh, he says with the venerable Ananda, could you please wait a moment out of compassion, right? And it's this um, kind of very it's, it's nice way of asking somebody. You're asking, asking for a favor, uh, but you're asking in a kind of in a very uh, you know, hum, humble way. You're basically, you know, it's like you know, saying, you know, out of compassion for me, would you please wait? Uh, I, I have this need to talk, f- talk to you. You're kind of appealing to somebody's higher emotions and higher spiritual qualities uh, when you, by, by saying it in such a way. Uh, so please, out of compassion, would you would you wait for me so we can have a have a talk? Yeah. I quite like that. It's a kind of a it's a very it's a nice way of uh, of asking for a favor, basically. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yes, sire, the man replied, and he went to the venerable Ananda, and after paying homage to him, he stood at one side and said to the venerable Ananda, "Venerable sir, King Pasenadi of Kosala." pays homage with his feet at the venerable uh, with his head at venerable ananda's feet and he says this venerable sir if the venerable ananda has no urgent business perhaps the venerable ananda would wait a moment out of compassion the venerable ananda consented in silence then king pasenadi went by elephant as far as the elephant could go and then he dismounted and went to the venerable ananda on foot after paying homage to him, he stood at one side and said to the Venerable Ananda, If, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda has no urgent business, it would be good if he would go to the bank of the river Achiravati out of compassion. The Venerable Ananda consented in silence. He went to the bank of the river Achiravati and sat down at the root of a tree on a seat made ready. Then King Pasenadi went by elephant as far as the elephant could go, and then he dismounted and went to the Venerable Ananda on foot. After paying homage to him, he stood at one side and said to the Venerable Ananda, Here, Venerable Sir, is an elephant rug. Let the Venerable Ananda be seated on it. So here we, we have this um, uh, the meeting between uh, King Pasenadi and uh, Venerable Ananda, and it's a very elaborate, right? A very kind of formal, the way this whole meeting is established. First, he sends a man, you know, he thinks maybe he sees Venerable Anand in the distance. He sends a man who pays respect to him, and the man reports back. Then he goes to Venerable Ananda on elephant and asks, can we meet in a different place? Then they go there. And it's very, very elaborate, the whole, the whole thing here. Yeah. And it's interesting when you compare this with the, again, with the uh, Chinese version of the Sutta. Uh, the Chinese version also has certain elaborations on how this meeting has taken place, but the elaborations are done differently. It's more about, you know, he asks three times, uh, or he, uh, you know, he pays homage to, to Venerable Ananda and these kind of things. Uh, so there too, it is quite, you know, quite elaborate and quite formal, the whole thing, but the formality is different, uh, right? So, so what does that mean? And... Um, uh, what I what I think it means is that uh, many of these things, obviously, this is the, the narrative context around the actual conversation, uh, and there w- would have been added later, so people knew that certain formalities would have taken place. King Pasenadi was a Buddhist, right? So there would have been certain polite uh, conversation, certain formalities would have taken place. Uh, but the exact content of those formalities would have been uncertain, right? And that's why one version is different from the other one. But both of them are very elaborate. And it's very likely that in retrospect, looking back, that these things would have been boosted up a little bit. And that's why they are elaborate in, in different ways. And uh, I, I think for that reason, because it, as I see it, it's quite likely that you, you know, you, as a, uh, as a Buddhist, uh, you like to kind of elevate uh, Venerable Ananda's status vis-à-vis the Buddha. That's kind of a natural thing to do, uh, especially in retrospect, you know, for later reciters. Uh, I think in reality, probably the meeting was much more simple, right? It was much less formal. Uh, it was much more direct, and it didn't have all these elaborations around it. Uh, I think this is what you see here when you see these differences, right? The differences point to something um, you know, something has been added later on, which probably is not, wasn't there originally. Huh? And I think that is an important point, because some, as Buddhists, we often use these texts as guidelines for how to behave, right? A lot of the behavior we see in Buddhist circles are based on how 
uh, the suitors present the appropriate behavior. Huh? Uh, you know, we still do circumambulations of things, we do, you know, Anjali, we do all these things which are essentially Buddhist behavior, and it comes, goes back to the suttas. Uh, so if we take the suttas too literally, uh, and we don't understand the kind of historical context and the, and the uh, likely changes that have occurred, uh, then often we can perhaps become too, too formal, right? Too rigid in the way we do things. Uh, and this, is also, this can also be a problem sometimes. Uh, so you have to find that balance where it is, uh, it's nice to be polite, but not kind of overly rigid and formal, because uh, then you, you take away some of the kind of naturalness and um, naturalness of communication that, that should go on uh, between Buddhists, whether they're monastics or lay people or whatever. Uh. So I think that is a, it's a, I think it's an important point to keep these things in mind, uh, and uh, <coughs> otherwise you, you can be led astray, even by little things like that. Uh, I, I think. Yeah. Anyway, so and then we, the next thing here is uh, uh, he, uh, he has an elephant rug, right? And he says to Venerable Ananda, "Please be seated on this elephant rug." Uh, an elephant rug, I think, is a kind of rug that you drape over the back of an elephant, right? A kind of probably very thick, kind of a, like a carpety kind of uh, substance. And he says to Venerable Ananda, please be seated on it. And, and Venerable Ananda re replies, there is no need, great king. Uh, sit down, I am sitting on my own mat. So he's refusing sitting on this elephant rug. So what does that mean? Why is just that little detail in there? It seems like a kind of detail which is irrelevant, right? Why have all this thing about, you know, sit on this elephant rug? And uh, one of the... Uh, Probably the reason why it's there is because there is a rule specifically in the monastic vinaya which says that monastics shouldn't sit on elephant rugs. <laughs> this is how detailed the vinaya is, right? It's very detailed. You have, you have the 200, you know, 217 rules of the Patimoka, but then you have two whole volumes of kind of tiny, tiny rules uh, which are you know, just add, added up over a long period of time. And one question then is, well, if it occurs here, and it occurs in the Vinaya, well, which, which came first? What is, you know, what is the first, what, what actually came first of these things? Was it first that Ananda decided it was inappropriate to sit on such a rug and then it became a rule? Or was there a rule laid down first and then Venerable Ananda said, no, I can't do it? And I think it's quite likely that what happened is that Venerable Ananda, that that rule comes from this story, right? The story is here, it's obviously inappropriate to do it, and then the rule was laid down. And this is, um, has to do with the evolution of the vinya. The vinya is, as far as I can see, is a set, that the discipline which is in there and all the rules for the monastics, they have evolved over a quite a long period of time. And you can see that, again, through comparative studies, certain things, uh, uh, like the Patimoka rules are obviously very, very ancient. You find them in all the Chinese versions, in the Tibetan versions, everything. Uh, but some of the other stuff, like the minor things, are, you find them only in certain places. Uh, so it is qu quite likely that it actually came from here, and then it was incorporated uh, into the Vinaya. Uh, but the main point of this, and this is one of the things that you find throughout the Vinaya Pitaka and throughout uh, elsewhere as well, uh, is this idea that it is inappropriate for monastics to use lux luxurious things. Uh, that is what is inappropriate. And the background stories for all of these minor rules are usually lay people complaining. They go to the Buddha and they say, ah, oh, you know, your monks, they're really dodgy, you know, they're using all these luxury goods and all these kind of things, you know, they shouldn't be doing that. And then the rule is laid down. No, don't use these items. They are too luxurious for monastics. And uh, so this is, this is really the story behind this. It is considered too luxurious, right? And, and this is a general principle that applies for the entire vinaya. A monastic shouldn't live a life with too much luxury, uh, or including using money and all these kind of things. Uh, and one of the problems is that very often we end up reading the rules as if the rules are what is important, rather than the general principles that lie behind those rules. Uh, so it is, of course, the general principles about not using luxury was what, that is important. You know, an elephant rug, we don't even know what an elephant rug is, right? And it's, it's, it sounds like something, it sounds quite, quite cool, an elephant rug, but uh, it's not something you have any relationship to. I've never heard or seen an elephant rug in my entire life. Uh, so the general principle is what matters, not the fact that you, you, know, you have to remember very clearly that never use an elephant rug. That's really, really important. Uh, <laughs> 
So, so this is, um, again, this is a matter of, uh, you know, understanding the, some of the ideas in the Vinaya that lie behind this. Uh, what is appropriate for a monastic and what isn't. Uh, and then you become more wise in using, using the Vinaya. Otherwise the Vinaya becomes like this ancient document which you implement in the present day. Literally, it becomes, sometimes it comes, becomes very silly, the whole thing, and it doesn't really work. It loses its purpose. And you, you, you can still do lots of luxurious things by, you know, because of the, they weren't put down in the Vinaya. You know, monks can, you know, you know this, this, the Vinaya doesn't say anything about cars, you know, so if you drive down in the Mercedes, that wouldn't be against the Vinaya and this kind of stuff. Uh, yes? Um, Who talking? Yeah. Uh, does it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, um, so you, yeah. In, in, in that, um, yeah. um, I mean, he's, he's, he, yeah. he, he, he refused to rise from the floor right, until his parents yeah. consented, right? And then he made it, right? Yeah. And then he came back. And, and, and when the, I think, a king, I mean, not, not this great king, yeah. not a king, I mean, further, further, further west. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it offered, you know, please sit on the elephant? Yes, that's interesting. I, m maybe kings, or, you know, kings probably rode on elephants. Maybe they had elephant rugs handy, you know. <laughs> so, so maybe that was a natural thing to do. Or it could be that it's just a standard kind of thing, you know, it, kind of, it became a standard way of saying things, so it kind of got in there by her. It's very hard to know exactly why, but uh, yeah. But it would have been, presumably, it would have been fairly standard, otherwise, it wouldn't have been kind of duplicated like, like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's Ratapala in the Ratapala Sutta in Tulakotita was the name of that town. Uh, but but uh, yeah, okay. So that is uh, is that little little thing, yeah. And um, yes, K then we go on. Uh, and King Pasenadi of Kosala sat down on a seat made ready and said, Venerable Ananda. Would the Blessed One behave with the body in such a way that he could be censured by wise recluses and Brahmins? No, great king, the Blessed One would not behave with the body in such a way that he could be censured by wise recluses and Brahmins. Uh, would the Blessed One, Venerable Ananda, behave with speech, behave with the mind in such a way that he could be censured by wise recluses and Brahmins? No, great king, the Blessed One would not behave with speech and behave with mind in such a way that he could be censured by wise recluses and Brahmins. And the king says, it is wonderful, Venerable Sir, it is marvelous. For what we were unable to accomplish with a question uh, has been accomplished by the Venerable Ananda with an answer to that question. Uh, we do not recognize anything of value in the praise and blame of others spoken by foolish, ignorant persons who speak without having investigated and evaluated. Uh, but we recognize as valuable the praise and blame of others spoken by wise, intelligent and sagacious persons who speak after having investigated and evaluated. So um, here uh, we have um, the king saying that Ananda has accomplished with his answer what uh, the king was not able to accomplish with his question. And it's not immediately obvious what that means, because um, uh, the way the text here is structured, there doesn't seem to be much difference between the question and the answer. They're pretty much phrased in the same way. But there are alternative readings of this passage. Uh, the Chinese version is different. Some of the Pali versions are different as well. And in those versions, this, the, the questioning goes as follows. The question in, from King Pasenadi, he says, Venerable Ananda, would the Blessed One behave with the body in such a way that he would be censured by recluses and Brahmins? The word wise is missing here. And then he replies, uh, No, Grand King, the Blessed One would not behave with the body in such a way that he would be censured by wise recluses and Brahmins. Right? So the king leaves out the word wise. And of course, uh, and Ananda says, well, he, he might be censured by some recluse in Brahmins who are not wise, but by the wise ones who have a, you know, who, who see things in the, 
in a, in a reasonable way, he would not be not be censured. Uh, and this is the point, kind of the, the the distinction here, and the difference that then the kind of the rest of the paragraph suddenly uh, starts to make sense. And uh, so, what does it mean then to be wise? It kind of you know it sounds like it's kind of a self-fulfilling, right? If you're Buddhist, well, of course, wise means you think like the Buddhists, right? Uh, <laughs> it's kind of, and of course, but that doesn't, that, that doesn't really, it's not really satisfactory if you look at it that way, because it sounds too kind of inward looking, we're just looking at Buddhists as such. But it's actually mentioned here what it means to be wise, because if you look at what King Pasenadi says, he says, the ignorant, foolish persons who speak without having investigated and evaluated. So that is essentially what in this context it means to be wise. You investigate, you don't speak without you know, looking at the evidence carefully, and then you speak up, and then you can say something about uh, what is actually going on. And this is one of the general principles that you find, uh, in a sense, throughout the Dhamma, this idea of being very careful in judging anyone or any situation. You look, you investigate, uh, you make a decision after a long period of time, not after a short period of time. Uh, you know, even to evaluate somebody's virtue or their wisdom, etc., is exactly the same thing. You evaluate things over a long period of time. Uh, so, if you have wise people, then he wouldn't be, uh, uh, they wouldn't actually censure the Buddha, uh, because, of course, according to the Buddhist idea, the Buddha doesn't do anything wrong, uh, either by body, speech, or by mind. Although it might perhaps look like that for some people. Uh, now the the interesting uh, thing here is that uh, when you look at this paragraph, uh, it looks in a sense as if the Buddha is not the Buddha, King Pasenadi is referring to something, right? Why is he saying these things? Uh, it sounds like somebody has been blaming the Buddha in a sense, right? Uh, otherwise, how would how would he actually? Why would he talk like this? It sounds like somebody has been blaming the Buddha and they were unwise. Uh, whereas Venerable Ananda is not the wise person, he kind of corrects that. Uh, so what is going on? Uh, and uh, what is going on according to the commentary is that there is a background story behind this. Uh, and that background story is that there was a female wanderer, uh, and she uh, and and then she was she was asked to go to the Buddhist monastery, to the Jetavana, and to visit the uh, the Buddhist monks and also the Buddha uh, on a regular basis. Some some dodgy characters who asked her to go there, so she would go to the Jetavana kind of regularly until it was known, you know, around the city, Samati, that this female wanderer was going to Jetavana all the time. Uh. And then once that was known by the general population and these dodgy, these shady characters or whoever they were, are not, they're trying to basically to uh, get the Buddha into, get him to have a bad reputation. Uh, and they killed that wanderer and they buried her in the Jetavana, right? Uh, and then later on they kind of, you know, made, made it so that somebody actually found her in the Jetavana. And of course, people straight away jumped to the conclusion, the Buddhist monks, they have killed this wanderer, what kind of... Dodgy, dodgy monks are we, you know, are we supporting? They're killing, killing these female wanderers and burying them in their own monastery. Uh, and this is a kind of the background story uh, behind this whole thing. Uh. And then the Buddha says, well, uh, you know, don't worry too much about this. Uh, just all you have to do is you have to, you know, go around and say that those people who, um, who spread false rumors about others, they're making a lot of bad karma for themselves. And then gradually people understood what was going on and, and pe things came back to, you know, th things were okay again. Uh, but what is, uh, what, what is perhaps interesting here, I find, is that the commentary has this story. Why is this story in the commentary? Uh, why isn't it actually in the sutta itself? Uh, this is an interesting point, right? If it is a real story, uh, if it is, if it actually talks about the events that happened prior to this, should, wouldn't it have been natural to have it as an introduction to the uh, to the sutta? There's two two possibilities why it is not there. One possibility is that it was made up later, right? Somebody sort of thought that, yeah, there, you know, there's a background story here. I can kind of vaguely remember something, and they write it down, and then it becomes, goes into the commentaries. But actually, it wasn't a, it wasn't the story that was known at the time when the sutta was, uh, you know, recited at the first council or whatever. Uh, so that is one possibility, that the story is not really genuine, or it may have some genuine facts, but has been distorted and otherwise. Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility is that it is a genuine story, but that those people who then recited the sutta, they decided to leave it out, right? Uh, that's the other possibility. Uh, and uh, the, 
and I think that possibility is also quite quite possible. Either one of those is you know is may have, may have happened. So why did they leave the story out? And this is one of the strange things, you know, the Buddhism is often known as a kind of great storytelling tradition, right? If you go into the latest strata of Buddhist literature, you have this massive Jataka tales, you have the tales in the Dhammapada commentary, and a lot of them very nice stories, very ins- often very inspiring, and very memorable, right? These are the stories that you hear when you... Uh, if you go out and you listen to Dhamma talks around the world, you very, very often Dhamma talks will be based on these stories from the Jatakas and the Dhammapada Atakata commentary. Uh, so, so Buddhism, in a sense, is a very is a great storytelling tradition. But if you go to the suttas, if you go to the word of the Buddha, there is very there's actually very, very few stories in there. You know, basically there are occasional stories about perhaps some kings in the ancient past, but it's actually they're very few and far between. And I think that uh, what, is, what is perhaps going on here is that the early, the compilers of the suttas, uh, they didn't really want to include the stories. Uh, if the Buddha didn't teach in terms of stories, then why should we include stories uh, uh, that he didn't teach? And there was this idea that we are focusing on one thing. We're focusing on the teaching. What did that Buddha actually teach? How did he teach? And the rest is just fluff. A fluff which often can lead the attention away from the essential message of the teaching itself. And I think this is kind of part of, part of the deal here. You want to, there's already so many suttas. There's already so much to understand, right? And to get your head around, to practice in the right way. Do we need stories that kind of lead you astray? And history has shown us that that's exactly what has happened. History has shown us that the more time has passed by, stories became more important. People forget the matter early teachings and they focus on the stories. So there was probably a very good reason why the Buddha didn't focus so much on the stories in the first place. Because he knew that it, they tend to become more popular. So this is, I, I, I think, um, an interesting point and something that is worth keeping in mind, right? Because sometimes you put out the kind of you, you, you have a too broad an interest in the Buddhist, in the Buddhist teachings and then you, your focus can often drift away from what is really essential and drifts into all kind of other, other areas. So I think this is why the suttas are so, so concise and so clear and so very uh, you know, straightforward in the way they teach and they leave out the things that have a, can have a distracting influence on the mind and which are not you know, a story can often be interpreted in many different ways, right? There's a kind of lots of possibilities there. So it's much more difficult to tell a clear and concise teaching through a story than through, you know, a, a, a direct sutta as, as the Buddha did. Okay. Anyway, I just, I just thought that was interesting. So, um, I, anyway. Oops. <laughs> so, uh, that is what he says then. Uh, and the, the, the king is obviously impressed by Venerable Ananda's answer. And then he goes on. So he, he is satisfied that he has investigated and evaluated properly. So then the king continues and he says, Now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior is censured by wise recluses and Brahmins? So now he's getting into the details, right? How, how does this actually work? So this is really now a discourse about morality, right? What is censured by wise people, of which obviously the Buddha and many of his monastic disciples would be part of that. And he replies, any bodily behavior that is unwholesome, great king. Unwholesome here is akusala. So it is the, you know, which is bad, which is unskillful which is, um, yeah, etc. And then the king continues his questioning, and he, here he continues his questioning until he feels that he has fully understood what is meant by this. So he says, Now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior is unwholesome, akusala? Any bodily behavior that is blameworthy, great king. Sa vajja. vajja. Vajja means like a fault, so which is faulty or has a fault to it, right? So it's blameworthy. Sa vajja, great king here. Now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior is blameworthy? Any bodily behavior that brings affliction, great king here. Suffering, affliction here. Now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior brings affliction? Any bodily behavior that has 
painful results, great king. Right? Any action that has painful results, that is considered bad bodily action. So very, and this really is kind of the, the basis for, for all of Buddhist morality, right? When we talk about morality in Buddhism, it's a very pragmatic thing. It's something based on very real experiences in the world. It's not a system which has been kind of established uh, as a kind of philosophical thing based on certain axioms and, and assumptions at the bottom and you build up a system of morality and this is it, pl you plonk it down. No, it's a very natural system of morality that is based on whatever is hurtful, that is immoral. And that's what it's saying, it's saying here, anything which results in pain. If you do an act which results in pain, then it is immoral. And that, that is, a, I think, one of those beautiful things about the Buddhist teachings, that it is such an incredibly pragmatic and down-to-earth system, all the way through, right? Morality is, is based on a very obvious, in a sense, when you think about it, it's, it's very obvious, but the vast majority of the world don't think about morality in this way. But it's very obvious that it is. So if it ends in suffering, for whom? Well, for anyone, right? For other people, for yourself, for, for whatever it is. Uh, if it ends in suffering, then it is unwholesome actions of the body. Uh, and of course, again, because it's, it is such a pragmatic way of looking at morality and virtue, it means that there is an enormous amount of flexibility worked into that system. Uh, and that's why, as Buddhists, we can deal with all these kind of modern dilemmas of, of um, ethics in a, quite, in a so very sophisticated way by modern standards. Uh, you know, lots of traditional religions cannot deal with these issues at all. Uh, but as Buddhists, you can actually deal with them in a very sophisticated way, sometimes more sophisticated than even modern philosophers can, can deal with them. Uh, which, is, which is actually quite nice. Uh, and in that sense, it is quite a modern, a modern uh, teaching, the Buddhist teaching. Yeah. Anyway, so then he takes the questioning a step further and he says, now Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior has painful results? And then he says, any bodily behavior, great king, that leads to one's own affliction, to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both, and on account of which unwholesome states increase and wholesome states diminish. Such bodily behavior is censured by wise recluses and Brahmins, great king. Uh, I, I should say that, you know, please ask at any time during this talk, that's usually how, how we, if you are new to this class or whatever, you're allowed to ask questions at any time if you haven't, anything is unclear or whatever. So, uh, this is then kind of the final basis, right, for what morality is all about. Uh, this is what he says, if it leads to the affliction of others, oneself, or both. Uh, that is how you, you decide if something is moral. Uh, and this means one's own affliction is obvious, you know, you, you, um, uh, whatever is hurt, if you do something hurtful for yourself, and of course from a Buddhist point of view, you take into account things like karma, right? So you, uh, and, and remember that karma is not just, very often we think about karma as creating suffering for ourselves in the future by what we're, what we're doing now. But very often you can experience that karma very immediately right now. You do something bad and it just doesn't feel right inside of you. Huh? You lose your sense of energy or whatever. Huh? So you can experience that straight away and you can know that it is actually isn't very good. Huh? So anyway, so that's hurting yourself, right? Uh, hurting others. Again, this is very obvious, you know, what it means to hurt others. Huh? And then hurting both. And, of course, this is again one of those, I think, great insights in, in Buddhism is that if you do something bad, it almost invariably hurts both people. It hurts yourself and it hurts the other person. And this is why I think this is kind of separated out as a separate category. Sometimes we like to think that, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to be the you know, martyr or whatever. I'm going to uh, do something nice to others, but it's bad for me. But the reality is that if it really is a good thing, it is usually good for both. And this is why I think the Buddha takes all of these three positions to make clear that everything is actually covered in this way here. So this is one of those ways, one of the basic teachings of morality that you find throughout the suttas, whether it leads to suffering for yourself and other people. But there is another teaching on that, right? And that is, of course, is the teaching of intention. And that is... Uh, 
what is your intention? Is your intention wholesome or is your, in, your intention unwholesome? And that is the other way of looking at morality. So one way is to look at whether it leads to pain for other beings and yourself. Another one is to look at your intention. What is the thing that drives you? Uh, uh, what, is, you know, what is it that actually, is that pure or is that impure? So what is the relationship between those two things? Why is it that the Buddha gives two different ways of understanding the laws of morality, or what is moral or not? Why does it talk on the one hand about intention and motivation that drives the action, and on the other hand he talks about what leads to the suffering of people? And, uh, okay, just one second, I'll come back to you in a second. And uh, I think the answer is that these are two, sep two different frameworks that are used often at different occasions and different times, right? Sometimes one framework may not be entirely clear, so you bring the other one in. Or the other one may not be clear, so you bring the first one in. You have two different ways of looking at it. And of course the simpler one here, and it, it, that's probably why he's teaching this to the king, it's the simpler one is simply to think about what you're doing is bad for others and for yourself. This is the simplest way of looking at morality. But it isn't always uh, foolproof. Sometimes you think that you're doing the right thing, but then when you look inside of yourself, you realize I'm coming from desire perhaps, right? Or attachment. There's a certain vested interest there. I have an interest and for that reason your action isn't perhaps as pure as you would like it to be. Are you really looking out for the other person or are you also looking out for yourself? And often these things can be very complicated. You're doing a bit of both basically very often. So for that reason, this idea of looking at other people's be whether it leads to good or bad things is great but it's actually even more powerful and even more profound to know where you are coming from personally. If you can look into your own mind and you can understand what is the driving force that makes you do things, if you can understand your intentions and the motivations that lie behind those intentions, then you can understand morality fully, completely and absolutely. The problem with that is that it's often very hard to do. You look into your mind and sometimes we're not able to fully see uh, the defilements in our own mind, how deep they go to see all the kind of desires and attachments and, and uh, you know, maybe uh, ill will, restlessness that is there. And because you can't see it fully, you have to fall back on what leads to other people's uh, happiness and your own happiness. But they're both very, very useful things. And ideally, as you kind of progress on the path, as you get to know your mind better, as you, you know, especially when your meditation starts to become very deep, you have enough understanding of your own mind that you can actually tell with absolute certainty whether the mind is pure or not, absolutely pure or not. So these are two different frameworks and they are often can be used together and they can be used at different times. The most profound one is the one which looks at the motivation but the one which is often perhaps more easy to use is the one where the things lead to affliction or not. Anyway, do you still want to ha have a question at the back? I want to know, yeah. um, I the intention may be very good, yeah. however it creates pain for another person when you suggest something to them. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the Buddha says that that is okay, but it depends on the situation, right? And he says that you, you, you can do what is painful for the other person, but it has to be beneficial for them, right? So he says that if you are doing it in the right way out of compassion, and it is beneficial for the other person, then it is sometimes, sometimes, then it is okay, acceptable to do what is painful. It's like, and the, and the simile that the Buddha gives, he says, it's a simile of a child. A small child is choking on something, right? They're choking on something, and that if you, you know, maybe a piece of meat or something stuck in their throat, right? Now, if you don't do something, that, that child may die because they can't breathe. So, you, so what you do, you stick your finger down the throat, that's what, what the sutta says, stick your finger down the throat and you pull out that piece of meat so they don't actually choke to death. In the process, you might hurt them. You know, they might, you know, it might be some, yeah. Yeah. Um, same, same thing. Yeah. This is just a simile to show you. How, this is just meant as a simile, right? But it shows you, uh, you know, often the mental things are even more important than those critical things because in the long run they're even more important, right? What is our happiness in the long run? But so it's the same kind of same kind of idea. So if the Buddha thinks that he can point out something that in the long run will be for your benefit, even if it hurts a little bit now, that's okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. Bhante, is it fair to say with the intention that uh, you're going to have that your energies go along with that intention so that if there's good intention you're going to get an expansion of energy, it's going to be energising and uh, if it's wrong intention or unhelpful intention okay. you're going to get a contraction? In other words, yeah. is there a gut reaction linked into intention? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would definitely say so, very strongly so. I, and I think you can experience that directly for yourself. I certainly experience that. I think to me it's very clear, you know, when you, when you sometimes when you have a very nice thought or do something nice, it kind of, wow, you feel, it energizes you, right? You can feel that. Uh, and that, of course, is directly linked with your intention, uh, what you're doing. Uh, and if you have a negative intention, it bloom, kind of dra drags you down. Uh, even just the thinking mind can do that. Uh, so it, it's just a matter of being aware of it. You just have to feel it, right? Uh, and when you start feeling these things, you start to understand how this whole process works. This is really karma in action, karma right here and right now. Uh, and if you build that up, you're just dragging yourself down or you're building yourself up uh, one way or the other. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Everybody happy? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this is, uh, so it basically is a disquisition here from the Buddha about the nature of virtue. Well, this is all from Venerable Ananda on the nature of virtue. And the king is questioning him. And then the last part here then is on account of, uh, any bodily behavior that leads to, or on account of which, unwholesome states increase and wholesome states diminish, right? This is another way of looking at morality. What does it do to you? Does it lead to an increase in the unwholesome and a diminishment in the wholesome? Then again, they are to be censured by the wise recluses and Brahmins, great king. And again, this is exactly what you're saying, Chris, right? If sometimes you can feel those mental states right here and now diminishing. You can feel that the energy drops. A lower energy state is, is, is worse than a high energy state. There's less joy there. There's less clarity, less mindfulness. All of these things, joy, mindfulness, and energy, they're all part of the same package of states which tend to go together. So, yeah, so you can actually feel that right, right away. And this is one of those, again, I always like this particular teaching, and it's something you find throughout the suttas. I find it very pragmatic, again, and very useful, right? You are, whatever leads, or whatever um, leads to, some, to unwholesome qualities inside of you increasing, and the good qualities decreasing, that is immoral, that is bad, that is what you should avoid. Incredibly, incredibly powerful teaching, and you can apply this across the board, you know, in so many situations in life, almost to anything in life, basically. What should I do? What should I, should I live here or there? Should I, which religion? What, you know, how should I think? How should I, almost anything you can apply this, this thing to. And because the whole purpose of the Buddhist life is to increase the wholesome states and decline and reduce the bad ones, because that's the purpose of life in a sense, it takes on it, this kind of teaching takes on a very, uh, very high degree of importance. Uh, and you can see it here, it's kind of hidden away in a small little phrase, right, in one sutta. Uh, but then you start to realize, actually, it's not just here that is hidden away, you find it in so many different places. Uh, you find whole suttas that just expound this particular principle. Uh, so, uh, again, an important one here. Uh. Okay, so that is the main content of the sutta. And now the rest of the much of the rest is basically just repetition of this, so we can do the rest fairly uh, fairly quickly. Here. Now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of verbal behavior is censured by recluses and Brahmins? Any verbal behavior that is unwholesome, uh, uh, and the whole thing is repeated. Now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of mental behavior is censured by wise recluses and Brahmins? Any mental behavior that is unwholesome, and the same thing is repeated again. Now, Venerable Ananda, does the Blessed One praise or only praise the abandoning of all unwholesome states? And uh, the point here seems to be, is it something that he just talks about, or is he also practicing in, uh, in this way? That seems to be the point. Just one second, I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, and then he replies, the Tathagata great king has abandoned all unwholesome states and he possesses the good qualities. So here the point is simply that the Buddha doesn't just talk about these things, he has also 
uh, he, he, you know, he's not a hypocrite, he practices, uh, he walks the talk, as they like to say these days. So, so uh, yes, I think the, the, the microphone is coming behind there. <laughs> Bhante, I was just wondering about the mental behaviour there and how um, that would mirror the structure of the other sections where it's talking about causing suffering to self and others, or both. Okay. Yeah. How, how do you get the others part into mental? Well, I, I think I think there it is just that you are, you know, if you have a bad mental state, it has a, it will have a tendency to come out in your actions and speech, right? Uh, so you actually, the potential is increased. The potential for doing something harmful, harmful is increased if you think in a bad way. Yeah. But maybe it is also more direct, you know. If you, I don't know, I mean, if you think bad thoughts, maybe you kind of, you're sending out bad vibes, you know. Sometimes you get somebody coming into the room and straight away you feel, oh, you know, there's something wrong here. He doesn't have to even open his mouth. You kind of get this, this feeling straight away here. Yeah. And sometimes I think there is more, more to there are all these kind of things, hidden things that we're not really aware of going on there as well, which which made actually bad as well. If somebody has a lot of meta, you can often feel that, you know, you and you it feels good to be around them, you know. So, um, yeah. Anyway, I think that's basically what it means. So, um, yes, we talk. Just a very minor point here. Yeah. Oh, the Venerable Ananda addresses the Buddha as uh, the target. Uh, so it seems, uh, yeah, the target of the king. Uh, yeah. yeah. Usually he would say the blessed one, wouldn't he? Yeah. And maybe, maybe the point here is that the blessed one is a very general term that was used perhaps in society in those days. And Tathagata perhaps is a term which more relates to somebody who is uh, very highly spiritually attained perhaps. So because here he's talking about the attainments, maybe he uses that term to kind of lift the Buddha up, show that he is somebody spiritually attained. Maybe that's the reason for that. I see. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. And, and just curious, I mean, historically, yeah. when did we evolve from addressing the Buddha as blessed one and calling him Buddha? Uh, the, the word Buddha does occur occasionally in the suttas. Yeah. Uh, it's very, mind, very, very seldom. It, it's very rare, yeah. So Buddha, it seems to be more, has, has moved that way in my later years. But I think, yeah, um, I think the word Buddha is more talking about the Buddha, uh, whereas the blessed one is often how you would, you would address him, right? Uh, you would say, oh, the blessed one, how does the blessed one feel today? Uh, yeah. yeah. That is true. The word Buddha seems to be later, but it's a kind of term that is being used used these days, of course. Okay. So, um, now, Venerable Ananda, so now we come to the uh, reverse, right? We have seen all the things that are censured by uh, the Buddha. Now, what are the things that are not censured by the Buddha, which are praised by the Buddha? Uh, now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior is uncensured by uh, recluses and Brahmins, or wise recluses and Brahmins? Uh, any bodily behavior that is wholesome, great king, right? Any kusala, uh, kusala bodily behavior. Uh, now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior is kusala, is wholesome? Uh, any bodily behavior that is blameless, great king. Uh, now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior is blameless? Um, you know, yeah, it should, okay. Any bodily behavior that does not bring affliction, great king, does not bring suffering. Yeah? Now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior does not bring affliction? Any bodily behavior that has pleasant results, great king. Yeah? And now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of bodily behavior has pleasant results? By the way, the word for that is sukha vipaka. So the word vipaka that we often use in Buddhism, that's, that's the word that is used here for results. You have dukkha vipaka, unpleasant results, and sukha vipaka, which is the uh, pleasant results. And he says, any bodily behavior, great king, that does not lead to one's own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both, uh, and on account of which the wholesome states diminish, uh, unwholesome states diminish, and the wholesome states increase, such bodily behavior, great king, is uncensured 
by the wise recluses and Brahmins. So again, the exact opposite, right? So the wholesome actions are, first of all, um, the actions which lead to people's happiness, or does not lead to suffering at the very least, but ideally lead to happiness. That's even, even better. So this is the first one. And the second one is then, uh, the more profound way of looking at it, is to look at your own mind and see what is motivating you again. Uh, and if you're not motivated by the unwholesome roots, but you're motivated by the wholesome roots instead, uh, the absence of defilements, then that is the most profound way of understanding um, uh, what is good karma and bad karma in, in, in the end. Uh, so just the opposite of what I was talking about before. Uh, so I'm not going to say any more about that. I'm going to finish, uh, finish off with verbal and mental behavior. Now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of verbal behavior is uncensored by wise recluses and Brahmins? Uh, any verbal behavior that is wholesome? Uh, and now, Venerable Ananda, what kind of mental behavior is uncensored by wise recluses and Brahmins? Uh, any mental behavior that is uh, wholesome. Now, Venerable Ananda, does the Blessed One pr only praise the undertaking of all wholesome states? The Tathagata, Great King, has abandoned all unwholesome states and possesses wholesome states. It is wonderful, Venerable Sir, it is marvelous how well that has been expressed by the Venerable Ananda, and we are satisfied and pleased by what has been so well expressed by him. Venerable Sir, we are so satisfied and pleased with what, the Vener what has been so well expressed by the Venerable Ananda, that if the elephant treasure was allowed to him, we would give it to him. If the horse treasure was allowed to him, we would give that to him. If the boon of a village was allowed to him, we would give that to him too. But we know, Venerable Sir, that these are not allowable for the Venerable Ananda. But there is this cloak of mine, Venerable Sir, which was sent to me, packed in a royal umbrella case by King Ajatasattu of Magadha, sixteen hands long and eight hands wide. Let the Venerable Ananda accept it out of compassion. So, uh, uh, what are, one of the little things that may be perhaps worth us noting in, in passing here is this uh, r rather typically Buddhist way of expressing the good qualities, which is kind of strange, uh, is always expressed by the absence of bad qualities, right? Uh, just looking back at what we said before, what are the things that are uncensored by wise ascetics and Brahmins? Uh, he doesn't say it is metta and compassion and renunciation or whatever. He doesn't say that. What he says is the absence of the bad things that is, that is, censured, that is not censured. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a very Buddhist way of of looking at the world, and why is it that the Buddha talks in this way, and that this is the, what you actually find throughout the suttas? Why don't they actually expressly say the good qualities? Why do they say the absence of the bad ones? And uh, the reason for that, I, I think, is that uh, just saying the absence of the bad ones is, is broader than specifically saying the presence of good ones. Right? So some of these qualities can be very, very profound. Like, for example, if you have pure equanimity, for example, if you go to the highest jhanas, you have pure sense of, of, of just looking on without any kind of, you don't really have any emotional reactions to things. That is considered a higher state in Buddhism, right? Than metta or compassion or, uh, or even, uh, you know, uh, joy or happiness on these kind of things. So the point is that the Buddhist path is so profound and it includes such profound things uh, that sometimes you have to speak in terms of the absence of the bad ones rather than specifying the good ones. If you specify the good ones, you're narrowing it down too much. Uh, but it, actually because there is this broad uh, qualities which really can only be expressed in terms of the uh, absence of the bad ones. Uh, I think that's why it, it works in this way. And it says something about the profundity again uh, of the Buddhist path that you have to express it in this particular way. Uh. Anyway, it's just a small side issue, but I, I think it's interesting because it, um, it is um, kind of a very Buddhist way of doing things. So. Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, following on, on, on the point you mentioned just now, it seems yeah. as if you, you, you taught earlier that, uh, I mean, Buddha taught about the 
the good results, the, the white and yeah. the black, right? Yeah. The absolute white and the absolute black, but there's also the gray. Yeah. And then neither black nor white, right? Yeah. So, as you say, yeah. I mean, this can only be characterized by the absence of black. Right, yeah. In, in yeah, yep. Yeah. And, and you yeah. say that, yeah. uh, well, the Buddha can choose not to teach at all, and that's absolutely okay. That's the thing, yeah. you can just, just you know, hang out in, in jhanas. Yeah. teach. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it can be so, that low yeah. profile. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's very broad. Kind of the idea of, of what's wholesome is very much broader than specific good qualities. It and that's need the to evangelize. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. 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 Good. Huh? So, um, yeah. Okay. And then he, uh, he is so happy. He is so satisfied. We are so, so satisfied and pleased that we would want to give Ben Ananda all these things, like an elephant, right? Or a horse. Here it says elephant treasure, but the and horse treasure, but these are really things that uh, belong to the, the mythological wheel-turning monarch. And this is a kind of a Buddhist mythology that you find in certain suttas. And here it seems to have made its made its way into this particular sutta. Probably the original meaning, and I think that's what you find in the Chinese version. It just says elephant or horse, which probably is more original. And he would give him a whole village. That's what they did in those days. The kings would give out villages, right? Especially to prominent Brahmins or whatever. They say, here, this, is your, this village is yours. You live, live off this village. And then they would live off that village, right? And then they kind of the, whatever, uh, whatever that village produced, that was, that was basically yours. That's how it, how it worked in those days. So uh, that's the sort of thing you can do when you have kind of, you know, kind of slave labor and these kind of things, I suppose. That's, rough, that's how, it, how it worked to some extent, unfortunately, but that's, you know, that's the way it was. So. And um, then he says, well, we have this one thing, however, which is allowable, this beautiful uh, cloth that he had received from uh, his uh, son, uh, King Adatasattu, was his nephew. Uh, his sister had been married to uh, King Bimbisara, and King Adatasattu was his nephew, and he had sent him this beautiful cloth. And you can imagine it probably would have been a very good cloth, right? If it's sent by one king to another one, uh, and it, you know, you wouldn't send, would send something very nice. Sixteen hands long by eight wide, it's about roughly four by two meters. And uh, so he wants to give that to Venerable Ananda. And this is one of those things, right? When you, when you hear a good teaching and you feel inspired by what you hear, you want to give, right? You want to do something in return. And this is, you know, kind of this, this feeling of reciprocity just happens automatically. And this is what you're seeing, seeing happening here. When you really feel uplifted, that somebody has done something uh, worthwhile, there's a sense that, you know, you, you want to support that person in return. And that is what you are, you are seeing here. He has obviously been inspired, right? Uplifted by what he has heard. And then when Ananda replies, it is not necessary, great king, my triple robe is complete. So he is, uh, uh, he's known to be a very frugal monk, Venerable Ananda, and I think in those days most, that's what the, the good monks were, which presumably is also the case today. Uh, and then the king says, Venerable Sir, this river, Achiravati, has been seen both by the Venerable Ananda and by ourselves, when a great cloud has rained heavily on the mountains. Then this river, Archiravati, overflows both its banks. So too, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda can make a triple robe for himself out of this cloak, and he can share out his old triple robe among his companions in the holy life. In this way, our offering will overflow. Venerable Sir, let the Venerable Ananda accept the cloak. Right? So he, uh, he kind of, when the Venerable Ananda is reluctant, he kind of brings up this beautiful simile, you know, this idea of how kind of one offering can then move on from him and move on to, to other people uh, uh, further down the line. Uh, and uh, how kind of, you know, good karma creates more good karma in a sense. Uh, so he, he, he's persuading here, in a, in a very beautiful way in my opinion, he's persuading Venom Anana to receive the robe. Uh, it's a very nice way of putting it, that one, the, the kind of the, the generosity overflows from one person to another one in this way. Uh. And of course, then what happens then is the Venerable Ananda accepts it. The Venerable Ananda accepted the cloak. And then King Pasenadi of Kosala said, And now, Venerable Sir, we depart. We are busy and have much to do. Now is the time, Great King, to do as you think fit. 
Then King Pasenadi of Kosala, having delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Ananda's words, rose from his seat. And after paying homage to the Venerable Ananda, keeping him on his right, he departed. Then soon after he had left, the Venerable Ananda went to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side, related to him his entire conversation with King Pasenadi of Kosala, and presented the cloak to the Blessed One. <laughs> so yeah, I like this whole, there's this kind of under thing here. I mean, the main message in the sutta is about morality, of course. But there are these little things, you know, here, this whole thing about generosity, how the generosity works here. The whole thing is very beautiful. First of all, the king, you know, persuades him to receive it by using a nice simile of how the offerings overflow, right? Then Ananda receives it, and, but then he uses that nice offering in turn to give it to the Buddha, right? Instead of taking it for himself. So it's like you can see all this good karma is being made, you know, from one, from one person to another one. It kind of moves, moves along in this way. It's very, very nice how this is done. And, uh, and this is one of the things, sometimes we feel, we, I don't need this, you know, I don't need this money, I don't need these requisites or whatever. But sometimes if you have things you don't need, you can give them away, right? It's great to have stuff you don't need, it means you give it away. And one of the monks told me that, uh, at the Bodhinana Monastery, he told me that his mother, she inherited, uh, her husband passed away, and she inherited a lot of money from this husband who passed away. And this monk said to me, ah, oh, you know, she, she, oh, she's not really interested. She doesn't really need the money. She's not really interested in the money here. Uh, but, but I said to him, well, what a wonderful thing it is to have so much money. And if you're not interested, if you don't need it, you can give it all away, right? Here you have this, all this money you can just hand out to other people here, or hand out to organizations or hand out to whatever. Is that a wonderful thing to be able to do that here? And this, so, so there's, this, there's always an opportunity there, right? You may feel that it is, sometimes it feels like a bit like a burden, but there's also an opportunity when you have things that you actually don't really require. And this opportunity is, of course, what Ananda, when Ananda is, is uh, taking advantage of right here, right now. So very, very nice. And I, I, I don't know, I find these little things, little, small little things in the suttas kind of hidden away, very quite inspiring. And, and, and it kind of, you know, you, you basically, you... Uh, you feel inspired to do the same thing when you read these things. So. Okay, so uh, we're coming to the very end. Then, uh, so he presented the cloak to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus. It is a gain, bhikkhus, for King Pasenadi of Kosala. It is a great gain for King Pasenadi of Kosala that he has had the opportunity of seeing and paying respect to Ananda. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So, so that is the uh, uh, Bahitika Sutta, a, a simple sutta, but nonetheless, I, I've, I find it very nice and very, very useful. Are there any last questions or comments or anything would like, anybody would like to make? Uh, John, yeah. Section 7, okay. Yeah, uh, it's only a minor thing, but it, yeah. as I understand, Ananda had just been on arms round. Yes. And, and right. But then when the king offered him the uh, elephant rug, yeah. he said, I have my own mat. He wouldn't be carrying his own mat around with him. Uh, well, this is the thing. Are they, you know, they, had, they, had, they would have had sitting cloths in those days as well. Huh? But he said mat. It doesn't say sitting cloth. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe, uh, let me look. Let me look that up in the parlor because I got the parlor here, so we can we can sort it out. I see see what it says about Matt. Well, it, it is possible that the terms are used synonymously. Yeah. It is possible that sometimes they use different terms for these things, you know. So I, I would I think so. It's hard to hard to be absolutely sure. Okay, yeah, he's, he's, what he says is that I'm sitting on my own seat. That's what literally what he's saying. Yeah. Nisinohang sake asane. Asane asana is a seat, basically. So it can mean almost anything here. And I think it could also be probably be stretched to include sitting cloth as well. So he probably has his own kind of thing that he's sitting on. I would assume uh, you know that it's a sitting cloth, but it might might also be something else. Yeah. But there are uh, you know in the 
in the suttas there are some examples of that where the Buddha says, you know, okay, let's go into the forest and do some meditation or whatever. And then he says to another, please bring the sitting cloth so we can sit on that. So that seems to have been the standard thing that they would sit on when they were outside of the kutis or outside in the forest, that they would have those things. It's not so prominent in the Pali Suttas. It is more prominent in some of the other traditions of Buddhism. For example, if you look at the uh, Sarvastivadin uh, Majjhima Nikaya, which is the Chinese translation uh, is from, uh, that one actually has much more about sitting cloths. Uh, so they always talk about bringing the sitting cloth wherever they're going here. Yeah. But in the Pali, it is usually left out. It isn't part of the actual text. Uh, yeah. That's just my guess, John. I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to be sure about these things, but just, uh, just a guess. Yeah. Yes, uh, over, over here. <laughs> you get very, very fit by having that microphone around. You? <laughs> Running off. Um, I was just curious, Bhante, the, the ending of the sutta has a feeling of one of those kind of generic um, closures, but is the gifting of the cloth to the Buddha across all of the different versions? Um, that is a good question. I think so. I, I, I probably would have picked it up if it wasn't, uh, because I read the other, I had a look at the comparative study for this, uh, but uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot guarantee that, uh, but I, I, I believe so. Okay, anything else? Any last minute things? No? Okay, very good. So let us just pay respect to Buddha Dhamma Sangha.